Well, you know what? This kind of came at a cool time because tonight's class is on gardening and, in a way, how to be self-reliant. There's a disclaimer. There's a lot of benefits for gardening. And one that I don't think he's even listed on here is the fact is if there's a pandemic or if there's a lockdown that we can't go around other people, which is pretty close to what we're at right now, we can grow our own food. We don't have to worry about there's a crazy rush. We can at least eat. But other benefits is the fact that you use a you burn calories, gardening, and doing yard work. Um, it's a way to move some of the lymph in your body. It can even lower the risk of certain kind of cancers, not just from moving around, which is part of it, but from the bacteria that's in the soil. We absorb it actually helps our immune system fight off other things. It helps reduce stress, it lowers blood pressure, and helps with muscle tension. Maybe not the first day, <laughs> because muscle tension, sometimes you find muscles that you weren't even sure you had. And again, as always, this link is where you can find this information. When you see a link that I don't talk about much, that's what it is. Um, it can help coordinate with coordination, balance, and strength. It is really gratifying, and you become more self-sufficient. I love this. Give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach a man to garden, and the whole neighborhood gets tomatoes or zucchinis. That's another thing. There's usually people giving free zucchinis away. Um, I'm LDS. I don't know if a lot of people know that. I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And our prophet, long time ago, encouraged us to grow all the food that we are able to. Now, I can't say that I do that. Um, but berry bushes, I have some of those. I don't have grapevines. Fruit trees, we have those. You know, if you're going to have a tree in your yard anyway, a lot of times if you get a fruit tree... It is helpful. The only bad thing is it does bring little critters like um, bees if you don't pick up the fruits. But if you have kids or grandkids, you always pay them, pick up the fruit, and dispose of it, put it in the compost or something like that. Okay, so we're going to get started. If you have any questions along the way, please feel free to ask. And um, we will ask it, I mean, answer it along the way. Joanne just put a link in the chat box. And this is the link that she put in there. And the page isn't found. Oops, sorry, Joanne. It's the but link we, that you had on the um, your other slide. Yeah, but it looks like they they changed it. So I just didn't check. I apologize. Right. But for other links you may put on there, if you click on it, then you can minimize it. And um, after class, you can read it if you want to. Okay, the first thing to know about planting is your zone. You know, you cannot plant down here, or you can plant down here, whenever you could just mess up your garden if you plant up here. So there's different zones. And this is a standard map zone. I am right smack dab in here, in this blue. I used to be in this blue. So um, I am zone E6, no, zone 11. So when you plant, whenever you get your seeds, usually they have the zone or they'll just tell you the zones. If you type in planting zone in Google, this will come up and you'll know whenever you're supposed to plant things. Most plants, you either have to buy the, I mean, most things that you grow, you need to buy the plants, or if you buy the seeds, you have to um, 
get him started first. Now, Joanne lives in Florida, so she probably doesn't have this problem. But our growing season isn't that long up here in Pennsylvania. If I put onions or if I put tomato seeds in the ground, whenever the zone tells you to, I'm probably, they're probably going to freeze out, frost out before I can, you know, harvest them. So there's different things that you can do. You can um, grow them in your house. This is something called a cold frame. And I had a cold frame back where I used to live. I don't garden as much as I used to, but I used to have a cold frame. And I would just take some tomatoes and I'd squish some seeds in there in the fall and just put a handful of, you know, plants. I would just bust up so the seeds would be there, put some dirt over it, and it would start growing in the spring. And this cold frame would keep them from getting frosted. It would also keep the heat in. And whenever it would start warming up and the buds start coming on trees, these plants would start growing. That's the easy, lazy man's way of doing it. There's different times when you would plant seeds through the plants or and root bulbs. So usually in the back of the package, it'll tell you. Pretty good guide for anywhere. I use seeds for things like beans, peas, zucchini, squash, uh, cucumbers, things like that. Tomato, I like the plants. There are certain seeds like um, ginseng, for instance. I used to grow ginseng. And the ginseng seeds has to be something we call stratified. I lived in Cambry County, Pennsylvania, which gets really hard winters there. There's times when they would have to cancel school because it would get so cold that the diesel would get like jello and they couldn't run the, the, tr uh, the buses. So we didn't have to worry about stratifying seeds. If you live in a place like Joanne and your seed has a hard husk to it, like a peach seed or ginseng or um, cherry trees or whatever, you may have to stratify the seeds. What you can do is put them in a plastic bag put them in a freezer, and let them there for a couple weeks. And they'll freeze, and when they freeze, they crack open. Then you can plant them. If you do do plants, there's certain things you need to know when picking your plants. Or if you're growing your own plants, make sure the plants are very healthy. Um... I worked in Lawn and, Garden, Lawn and Garden Center whenever people would come, and they would get some of the plants that look really terrible. And my ex-boss would say, no, nah, we're not going to sell those. We're just going to pitch those. People say, no, no, I'll buy them. And he says, you start with a bad plant, you're going to end up with a bad, bad plant. So try to make sure your plants are stocky, healthy, green, you know, not spindly and stuff like that. Whenever you get them, if you get them from the lawn and garden center, chances are they are grown under um, a greenhouse that doesn't get the full sunlight. When you bring them home, if you plant them that day, chances are the sun is going to burn them because they're not used to it. They haven't been hardened off. If you bring plants in from the greenhouse, what I do is I put them on the front of the porch that gets about two hours sun and then the shade covers it the rest of the day. And then I'll maybe put a little further out and further out until they've been in the, the um, sun the full day. If you are planting trees, fruit trees, big trees, or if you are planting bushes and things like that, they have they tell you to do something called water in a hole. If you dig a hole to plant your tree and you put the tree in there and you water it, chances are you're only going to get water to about here. 
while the roots are going to be down here. So if you dig a hole to plant a tree or a bush, fill the, the, the hole up with water. Let it drain. Fill it up with water again. Let it drain. Do that a couple times until it doesn't. It drains, but there's still a little bit of a mud puddle there. Then put just a little bit of dirt on top. Plant the tree or the bush, and then water it really good again. And that will encourage the roots to go down. But if you water just from the top, then the roots are going to go more like this, and it won't be as sturdy. I don't think they know that where I live now, or a lot everyone does. Because a couple of times whenever there's a lot of snow and the leaves aren't completely off, their trees just fall over. But back home, it was rare. You would see branches break off, but it was really rare for a whole tree to uproot because we all did the water in the hole. Something else, I know these are just random. I didn't really know where to put these, so don't worry. The rest of it will, will go a little bit better. There's something called dampening off. There's a right time and a wrong time to water your garden. You don't want to water, if the garden's like out in full sun, you don't want to water it at noon. Because if you do, the water droplets stay on the leaves and the sun acts like a prism or a magnifying glass and it can burn the um, leaves and it puts stress on the plant. At the same time, you don't want to water it at 9 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night because whenever you do, the dew comes up from the ground and it stays really wet around the roots. And it has something called dampening off. It can sometimes rot, get black spots on leaves or a fungus can grow in the leaf. We're going to talk a little bit about rooting hormones and we'll do that further on. And then, of course, you have to protect the plants from frost. If you plant them too early, you can have frost. You might have to cover them. If, let's say, it's in Maine, you never think it's going to frost where you were at, and you wake up and your garden is frosted, if it's really early in the morning, sometimes you can just water it and water the frost off and save the plants. But frost is definitely not your friend. And then we're going to talk about annual versus perennial in a minute here. Okay, There's, so that's good. Oh, sorry, good. on the your last slide, someone wants to know what material is in between the frame, a heavy plastic? Yeah. You can either do, you know how you can get like, Plastic, it almost looks like glass. Or you can just get clear plastic and staple it. You can also do windows. That's what my cool frame was. It was windows. My stepfather changed windows in his trailer, and I said, hey, give me those. And that's what I made. Well, the sides weren't. The sides were plastic, but the top was windows. Just something that is going to keep the moisture in and the heat in and the cold out. If you put it like this, even if it snows, I would just let it go and it, the plants would still, you know, be okay. Any other questions? That was a good question, by the way. That is it for now. Okay. All right. First thing you have to decide, okay, where am I going to put this garden? Getting the land the way that is going to be productive, because most people's land is not all that great. You have to do things to build it. And you don't want to spend all this time building this land, and then later on go, man, I wish I'd put my my garden over here. So figure out first the best way to put it. One thing is it should have full sun for most plants. Now, if you're going to do like ginger or a wild ginger or golden sill or something like that, of course it needs shade. But 
most annual plants need full sun. So make sure that. Look at where you're going to put your garden a couple times during the day. And if part of it is shaded, then you know that might not be the best place to put your garden. Where I live right now, we have our garden in a lousy place because the neighbor next door to us, the way the sun comes, they have these pine trees that shades most of our yard. But you you have to do what you have to do, you know? And we do get some stuff out of it. But try to get a place that's full sun. You want to make sure that there's going to be some drainage. And that you can change a little bit. But you don't want to do it in a swamp land. Also, make it convenient. My brother is probably one of the best gardeners I've ever seen in my life. He can get more out of a little piece of land than anyone else I've ever known. But he didn't realize what he knew, what he is realizing now. He planted up on the hill, away from where the hoses could reach. So he and his wife would take buckets and water the garden by hand. Well, now that he's heading, you know, kissing 70 here, he's not so keen about where he stuck his garden. But he put so much time and effort into it, he hates to give that part up. So make it convenient. Get extra hoses if you have to do it. Because whenever you're sitting here, you go, oh, man, it's almost supper time. I forgot to water the stupid garden. If it's going to be really hard to do, I'm telling you, you're not as likely to do it as if it's going to be easy. Also, you want to put it where kids or dogs or animals don't go around. If a kid plays baseball and hits a, the baseball in the garden, even if you said, don't go in the garden, I'm telling you, they'll probably go after it. And if you break any of the branches off of these plants, it's gone. So make it convenient, as convenient as possible. Good drainage, full sun. Then you have to prepare the soil. There's three levels of soil. There's soil that is real sandy, and that's if you scoop it up and you move your fingers, it just it's like sand. And it doesn't have to be made of sand. It just acts like sand. There's no moisture. It doesn't keep moisture at all. Then you have, and that would be this one right here. Then you have this two clay, and that's what this land here is. The land here is, has a topsoil, maybe about an inch and a half, two inches, and then it's nothing but clay. Clay doesn't allow the roots to go down the way that you want it to go down. So you don't, you want to, you'd have to work with this sand. You, you have to work with this sand. You'd have to work with this sand. The best dirt is black. It doesn't. Um, fluff away like sand. If you make, if you take a big pile of this dirt right here in your hand, it would make like a little ball. But if you would just poke at it, it would fall apart easily. That's whenever you know you have good soil. If it's too clay or if it's too sandy, compost and manure. And we're not talking fresh manure. You know, you don't let your dog go out and go wee-wee in your garden. I'll burn it. But you can get things like um, a year, two-year-old manure, usually from a local farmer. We got dirt and stuff like that delivered here for $50. And they gave us a whole big truckload full. Um, so you call around. You might have to Google them, you know online or whatever. And the compost, we're going to talk a whole lot about compost in a little while. You can do that yourself. That is what you can do for sandy soil. You can put manure and compost on clay soil as well, but you probably would want to add something like uh, peat moss. And I know peat moss is getting kind of rare. They're kind of stripping the world of peat moss. But you can also use ashes 
where I used to live, we had a coal furnace. And I saved the ashes, and we put the ashes on the in the dirt. And then we mix it around, because it was clay, too. And after a while, um, it wasn't so clay anymore. It was like good dirt. If you do not use manure and compost, you will probably have to use some kind of fertilizer. But the best fertilizer is manure and compost. It's good to check the pH of soil. I don't really do that because if you put ashes in with a little bit of lime and and compost, usually it's the pH is within range that your crops can grow. But that is something you may have to look at. If you've been gardening for a while and you just don't get what you think you should out of it, it could probably be the pH. And another way of seeing if your pH is okay and your ground is okay in general is worms. Whenever you have this soil, you should not have more than this much soil without having two or three worms in it, maybe even more. If you don't, then that means that your pH could be off. It could mean that it's too sandy or too clay. There are places where you can buy worms, like on Burpee. I don't know if Burpee has them anymore, but there's places where you can buy a bunch of worms and you can either grow the worms to a certain size or just put them right in your garden and hope they survive. And you want to rotate your crops. Different plants pull out different nutrients. If you do the same crop year after year after year, you're going to strip that land of those nutrients. Okay, does anybody have any questions about preparing the soil? No questions. Okay. This is just a joke. This old guy, his son was in the um, jail, and he says, Dad, I'm sorry I can't dig up your garden this year. And, oh, no, the old guy says, I wish you could dig up my garden. So the guy says, don't dig up the garden. That's where I buried the bodies. And then the next day, the cops came in and dug the whole garden up for him. So that's, that's what that is. All right. Now we're going to talk about compost. Compost is the ultimate recycling. It is a way of getting fertilizer, of fixing your soil, feeding your, your plants, and all that stuff for free. You can either buy a frame, I mean, build a frame, a compost frame, or you can go to your local extension office, just call your, you know, the, the courthouse, and say, do we have an extension office? Before, where I lived, you can get one of these compost makers for $5. You could only get it for like a couple days a year. They didn't have it any time you wanted to. But it's usually like um, Monday through Friday. That If you went up during those days, you can get a compost thingy. I don't even know what they call it. Um, for $5. And usually it came apart. Like this section here, this section here, and then that. So you can put it in your trunk or put it in your back of your car. I don't like either one of these. They're a lot of work because whenever you put compost down, you, whenever you like peel vegetables or fruits or eggshells, I used to put eggshells in mine, um, you put it in the container and then you dump it somewhere and you mix a little bit of dirt with it and some water and it starts to decay and it comes like soil, really, really thick, dark, black, very productive soil. If you do it on here, you have to aerate it. So you would have to take a pitchfork and you would have to dig it up and flip it over and stuff like that. Same with this. And this one's a real pain in the butt to do 
because um, you either have to take this section off or this section off. Then if it gets too high, it falls all over the place. Not my favorite. But what's really good about this is since it's so dark, it keeps the heat, and the heat will cause the stuff to decay much more quickly than if you have it out in the open like this. So that's the advantage. This is a, this is um, you can do it yourself. This is probably the cheapest way to go. Someday, when I'm rich, I'm going to buy me one of these. It's called a compost tumbler. And you put the compost in there with a little bit of dirt and some water, and you spin it. It has, on the other side, you can't see there, there's a handle that goes like this. And you just turn it. And let me tell you, it really saves your back. Or if you're really rich, you can do the double decker one. You know, some people dream of sport cars. If Ed McMahon came to my house, of course he's dead right now, but I don't think he's going to come. But if somebody came to my house and gave me a million dollars, this is what I would get. This is called a Mantis. 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 Whatever. But on the other side is that handle like this. So you could put all the stuff you want to compost in here the water, a little bit of dirt, and all your peelings. And it, you turn it, and then this thing can be empty. And while this is brewing, you can put some in here. So this is, like, amazing. They're a couple hundred dollars, like $500. So they are expensive. But they've, the person who did this was actually had to been a gardener because it is very easy to turn. They had one at a fair that I, w I went to. And even though it was really heavy inside, I think they had two things of cement, it was really easy to turn, even though it was heavy. And it was high enough that if you put um, a wheelbarrow under here, you could just tilt it and all the stuff fell under the wheelbarrow. So if any of these guys are rich, I'm telling you, this is the way to go. By any chance, are you able to give them that link, Joanne? Uh, let me try the first link. No, the Tumblr one didn't work. But the compost is really, really good for a lot of things. It's good for the world. You know, we have so much junk that we put in our, um, what you call it, in our landfills. Okay. So they have the single and they have the double. Let's see how much it is right now. No, they don't tell you. Last time I looked, I think it was $500. Okay, $649. It's been a while. Okay, now that we got all that out of the way, and w whenever I'm talking about composting for your thing, like I said, you save the landfill, and it, it's just kind of, it's kind of nice recycling like that especially if you're an old hippie like me. Now we're going to talk about individual plants. Asparagus. Anybody who wants to garden a little bit and then just ignore it for the rest of their lives, asparagus is the way to go. If you plant asparagus the right way, 30 years later you can still harvest that that asparagus with very, very little work. Easiest plant ever to grow. But it takes a lot of preparation. Asparagus absolutely needs a lot of drainage. Matter of fact, I would water my asparagus the, the first week and I never watered it again afterward, ever, even during a drought. Never had to water it again. 
but planting it is really important. What you do is you dig down about 18 inches to, or about 18 inches deep. And then you make that soil really, really nice. You put in some compost, you put in some peat, moss, whatever you need to do to keep it nice and loose and well drained. Then you plant the asparagus, probably about, it says a foot and a half apart. I probably did mine about a foot apart. Because it doesn't spread this way. They do get heavy and high, but a foot apart is fine. And after you plant them, you water them every day if it's, unless it's rained. You water them every day for a week, and then seriously, you don't have to ever water them again. And every spring, you just go out, and as they start growing, they start peeping out of the, the ground, uh, maybe eight inches, you just cut it off. What I did is I used to have 24 plants. I did half of the plants I would harvest in the beginning of the year. And then I would let them to go full, you know, grow fully up. And I would cut down the other plants, and then I would harvest from there. Whenever you cut them off, they'll send up another, I don't know what they'll call it, a sprout. Can't even think of what you call it. Sprig? But it'll put another shoot out. There you go, shoot. It'll put another shoot out. If you harvest it the whole way, all year long, you know, from when they first come up until the end, you're going to wear out your root, and then it starts getting really woody. Asparagus gets thick and woody. When I did it my way, if you cut it down, even though it was probably wider than your thumb, it was not woody at all. They love deep, deep, deep um, sun. And you don't grow them deeper than six inches, but you prepare the soil, like I said, way down here. So you, you prepare all this soil, which is about another foot, and then you plant them right here. But this has to be well-drained so that the roots can go down. And then... Maybe uh, my plants were 30 years old whenever I moved, and they were still good. They might still be good, but they had no sign of being less productive or getting woody at all. Another thing I did is I, on top of it, put black uh, plastic, and I cut a hole around it. Because I hate to weed. I really hate to weed. So I put black plastic around. And then as the plants start getting fuller like this, I just cut the plastic bigger and bigger and bigger. Asparagus is really very good for you. It's good for your kidneys. Um, you can even buy asparagus pills nowadays. So any questions about asparagus? No, it does sure. get tall in between. So um, you don't want to put it, it's real furry, I mean not furry, real lacy-like. The leaves are very fine. But it does grow probably up to, I don't know, maybe four foot. So you want to put it like right in front of some flowers or something because you're going to lose if you don't want to see those. And I'm sorry, Joanne, what did you say? Oh, no, I was just saying no questions. Okay. Okay, there are beans. There's two different kinds of beans. There's bush beans and there's pool beans. I personally like the bush beans better because every time I try to do this, the pool beans, the weight of the beans will pull them down. And um, 
And I just think I, I like the bush beans better. That's just my own personal opinion. You put in full sun, and they tell you to put them three, four inches apart. But I do what is called wide row planting. So instead of doing like a row like this and then a row like this and a row like this, what I do is I do this and then three inches from that I do this and three inches from that I do this. So there's like a big block of beans rather than just a bunch of skinny lines. Then that way, when the beans get a certain size, you don't have to weed anymore. And when I say I hate weeding, I mean I really hate to weed. So after these get to a certain size, it drowns out all the little weeds that are coming up, and you don't, you don't have to weed. Your beans are just as good. It takes less time to water them and less land. To harvest them, I usually look at how many days in the package. So let's say the package says 60 days. I don't know how many days it is. I don't remember. I used to, but I just look at the back of the thing. And the day that I'm going to plant them, I will put an X on my calendar whenever it's about time for the check them again. And I'll check them maybe a week before that because sometimes they're a little bit early. depends how much water, how much sun they've had. Or sometimes it takes a little bit longer for the same reason. And I go through the beans, and I take off all the beans I can. And I let the beans in there because you usually get a second harvest out of it. The second time I harvest them, I just pull them out, and I harvest the beans in, and I pick the plants, and I put the plants in the compost maker. Any questions about beans? And snap bush beans are like the best ever. Okay, cabbage. I don't really like planting cabbage as well. I love homegrown cabbage. But it's just, it takes a lot of water. You know, you can't go a couple of days, a day or two without watering. You have to water pretty much every day to get decent cabbage. I usually get the little plants. The plants that I, when I get them, they're probably about five, six inches high, and I plant those. I leave a good enough space so they can get big. If you get them too close together, they don't get very big. There's a couple plants that are like that. Um, water them every single day. A lot of water. Cabbage sometimes gets worms. Worms could just wipe out a whole cabbage patch. There is something called peppermint. And some people plant peppermint in among their cabbage. The only bad thing for that is peppermint is like dandelions or like an, an, any kind of a weed. And um, <clears throat> they're very invasive, so they'll just go through your whole garden. Then you have to pull them. But what you can do is take peppermint and grow it somewhere else, grind it up, soak it in water, and then spray around your cabbage. Peppermint is a natural cabbage worm killer. Cabbage worms will not go anywhere where there's been peppermint sprayed on it. And the peppermint doesn't burn the leaves or anything like that, and it's not toxic. So if you spray the peppermint water on it, you could just harvest it like five minutes later and eat it and it not hurt you. Okay, carrots. Carrots like a really, really loose soil, almost sandy. If not, they'll grow about this big, and they'll have a bunch of little offshoots. If
if you want the nice long tapered um, carrot, then you want the the soil to be very very loose, probably down um, about a foot is what I would do. Carrot seeds are pretty small. You're supposed to space them two to four inches. And I don't know why I do this. I guess just because that's how my parents did it. But I would make a row, just like a little divot in the in the dirt. And then I would drop them along here. And then if they, when they start growing up, because they won't all grow up, then I'll take out the small ones to make sure they're about three or four inches after they sprouted up for a while. Well watered. And water long so that the root of the carrot wants to go down deep. I used to save a lot of my seeds. I never saved cabbage seeds. Um, but I did carrot seeds. Carrots are a biannual. The first year they produce the fruit, or the, this part here, the root. Every year it does that. Every other year it produces the things that, like the seeds, like the flowers they use for a seed. I would have in my big garden, and I used to have a pretty big garden, it's like 50 feet by 75 feet. That's a pretty decent sized garden. And I would have a section of biannuals, a section of annuals, and then I had some perennials. That seemed to work really well for me. Carrots are pretty amazing. In the wintertime, what we would do with the carrots is we would put them in these old galvanized tubs that kids used to give kids baths in, or I don't know what else they used them for, but we used to, when we were all stinky and stuff like that, sometimes my mom would put it out there and would spray each other with a hose and take a bath in these big galvanized, galvanized pans. But we'd fill it up with sand and plant the carrots in there. We'd have carrots put in there the whole year long. You can also keep them in your garden as long as you can get them out of the soil. If your soil doesn't freeze the whole way down, they're not as tender towards frost like other things were. Oops. Any questions about carrots? No questions. Okie dokie. Cucumbers. I love, love, love cucumbers. Cucumbers are a little bit of a pain in the butt. They don't like being fussed around with too much. I do it like this. They don't tell you to do it like this anymore. But again, this is how my parents taught me. What we would do is get the soil nice and loose. We would make mounds. See how this was raised up? We would get mounds and then we would Okay, so this would be like a mound, like this. And then we would kind of divot it in the top here. And we would plant the seeds. Make a little bit of dirt on top. But it would be divoted, so whenever you water it, um, it didn't just run down the sides. It would stay in that divot. Because cucumbers is another one, like lots and lots of water. If you want decent cucumbers. That's how we did it. And then they would just vine all over the place. Cucumbers don't like you pillow farting around with the vines very much. Um, so there's a lot of people that do it like this. They make like these little things that the vines can grow up. And because the fruit is heavy, it hangs. And you can just grab that. It's easier to find them. Because the cucumbers don't grow on top. They grow like underneath. So since they don't like being played around with, the vines don't, it's hard to find them sometimes. This makes it easier.
kale, um, really easy. Kale and lettuce and things like that are all pretty much the same way. You just put it in um, soil. It doesn't have to be very deep because their roots don't go very deep. You want to make sure it doesn't stay soggy because then it rots. And But you water it pretty much. Not as much as cucumbers, but probably pretty much every day. And lettuce is pretty much the same thing. Same with the sheep sorrel. Um, what else we used to grow? Can't think right now. Sheep sorrel, we used to grow that same way as well. Onions. Starting them from seeds, you should start them now. If you want to grow your own onions and you're going to do a seed, inside the house, start your seeds now. And you'll still end up with just a little thing like this that you have to plant, which is a pain in the butt. What I used to do is get onion sets. The seeds are really good for the green onions that you, like, eat the whole onion clean up to here. The set onions usually are bigger. So they're the ones that are about the size of tomato. When you get the onion sets, there's kinds that have been treated with chemicals. If you're trying to go organic, that's not the best way to do it. If you make sure that the ground itself is good, and has a lot of drainage, you probably don't need that. I think that treatment they put on there is to keep it from, like, rotting. Uh, it off. Was there a question? No, just setting somebody in. Okay. Onions are really good for the immune system. You know, this coronola, cor yeah, coronavirus, canola, coronavirus going around. Onions and garlic contain sulfur, and they really help you fight things. If someone would get a cold, for instance, I even do onion poultices on the chest. Onions are also, onions and garlic are the only two things that actually allows the heart muscle to cleanse. So onions are a good thing to have in your garden. And we used to just go out and get the green onions and just eat them right out of the garden. You'd bite the roots off, spit them out. Well, first you wipe it off in your shirt, of course, get the dirt off. Bite the roots off and then just eat the whole onion. Not necessarily the most sanitary thing, but... Okay, peas. I don't think I would try to grow peas in Florida. Peas like cold. Um... If you're going to grow peas this year up north, I would put them in now. Or you can put them in in the fall. But they're not going to do too good growing in June and July or August. Our neighbor would have the greatest peas you'd ever want to see. His pea plants and the paws he would get on were, uh, were absolutely remarkable. And this is what he would do. He'd plant them, and then he would put a piece of wood down, and he'd stomp up and down the wood to make sure they're packed really, really tight. And I don't know if that's what did it or not, but, man, he had great peas. I take the seeds, pea, pea seeds, little peas, and I soak them overnight. And I've had more success doing that than just taking them out of the package and planting them. Peas will tend to need something to grow on and vine up on. So if you put sticks in, I don't know if you can see them here, but there's a stick here, 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 and here, and then string. You want to put the string on because, you know, they're going to be growing in between the poles too but it will fall over if you don't. So that kind of keeps them all together. And you want to put the beans in pretty deep because 
plants get heavy enough that it can cause it, the whole thing just to fall down on you. And they like lots of water. Peppers. Peppers are the plants that some years you have amazing. You have so many peppers you don't know what to do with, and the next year you hardly get any peppers at all. I could never understand what I was doing wrong the times that happened. I don't know if that's just the energy of the earth that does that or whatever. Um, I usually, for peppers, I buy the plants. I don't grow them from the seeds. If you are going to grow them from the seeds, then you want to start them now in the house. Um, when you get them from the plant, you usually have them in these little cells. So you have like a little square block of dirt around the plant itself. You want to make sure that you have it completely under dirt. And they like lots and lots of water. They also like a little bit of acidic soil. I don't know what these other ones like. This is between six and eight. They like a sweet soil. Peppers like a little bit of acidic soil, although it does go up to eight. Um, what my mom and dad did, and I hope none of you guys drink coffee, so don't drink coffee for this, but my mom and dad used to drink coffee, and we put coffee all around our peppers and all around our tomato plants. It seemed to really make them grow well. After I had to garden on my own, my next-door neighbor would drink coffee, and I just asked him for his coffee grounds. He gave me his coffee grounds, and I did the same thing. Sweet potatoes. Most people um, get sweet potato plants, and that is the easiest way to do it because storing sweet potatoes is a little bit of a pain in the butt. What you do is you get a sweet potato, let's just say this is a sweet potato, and you cut it in half. Then what I did is I put, so we have like a half of a potato, sweet potato like this. I put toothpicks, four toothpicks, like this, so that it was like a table. And I put it in water up to here. And you have to make sure the water stays up like that. And then it will grow the roots. Whenever you grow them, you can cut like an eye off with a little bit of, of the potato, and you plant that. And then you cut this one off, and you plant that. And this one, I probably need these two since I'm so small, and do that. So you don't have to plant the whole potato in there. You can cut up in several parts. Make sure you keep them moist, but you don't want to drown them. So you want to water every day, but you don't soak it like you do other plants. Their roots do not go deep like regular potato plants do. Then whenever you want to harvest them, you just take them off, let them on the ground for a couple hours, and put them in your house or put them in a cool place. But you don't wash them off. You just kind of break all the dirt off that you can. And sweet potatoes work better if you let them age for a while. So if I would pick sweet potatoes today, I would not eat them today. I would probably eat them in a couple of weeks. They become sweeter and just so much better if you do that. Okay, now these are regular potatoes. These you grow in deep. These you don't. Um, just until, you know, I would probably put the dirt up to here. So up to there. Maybe about a half inch above it. The potato, these potatoes, I usually dig a hole probably about eight inches deep. Really, really deep hole. 
I do the same thing. I take the eye, and I would put that way down here, and then I would fill it up with dirt. And I'd water it quite a bit. After it starts getting up like this, I might even put more dirt around it after the plants get higher. You want none of the potatoes to hit the sun because they turn green and they're toxic then. You want to make sure that the potatoes are really down. You also want to make sure that all this dirt here is loose. If not, you won't get as many potatoes. And I'll show you another way you can grow potatoes if, if you don't have a yard in a minute. Radishes, the worst thing about radishes is they go from yummy to absolutely too hot very quickly. So this is another day. Look on the back of the package and um, put an X on your calendar so you know whenever you're supposed to harvest them. This skin should be very thin. If it gets too thick, it gets really bitey. Spinach is another one you grow just like the lettuce, the sorrel, all that stuff. Okay, zucchini. I grow zucchini like I do the cucumbers on hills. Again, I'm not really sure why my parents did that, but we always had amazing zucchinis. Um so I do that. I do know that they like drainage. That's probably a big part of it is so it can drain. Now, if you plant down here, they can be like little puddles. Matter of fact, when you wash, I mean, not when you wash, when you water them, all around the mounds is like a mud puddle. But those are, they're damp, but they have drained off. You can do a couple things with this. You can take the flowers of the zucchini and um, put put them in batter and fry them. Oh, so good. Then whenever the zucchini starts growing, you don't want it to get too thick. You want it to get, I don't know, maybe about a foot, a little over a foot. If you let them get huge, then they're too tough and they don't taste as good. Same with crooked neck squash. And you want to make sure that your zucchini and squash um, or different kinds of zucchini. I like the black jewel zucchini and the summer crooked neck squash. Those are the names of them. But if you mix other kind of squash in there, they will kind of cross-pollinate and you end up with stripes and all kind of craziness. It tastes okay, but you're not getting the full. If you save the seeds, you're not getting the pure species, as it were. I don't think species strain. Water them a lot, a whole lot. But again, the soil has to be such that it can they can drain off. Excess can drain off. There's a question. What do you use to deter squash bugs? You know what? I rotate my crops. I have never once, and I've been gardening now for about 35 years, I have never had squash bugs. So quite frankly, I don't know what to do. Where do you live? What state? Pennsylvania. Oh, I live in Pennsylvania. I don't know. I never had squash bugs before. Strasburg? Oh, that's close to me. I live in Landisville near um, Lancaster. Um, I really just don't know. 
Do you rotate your crops? Do you move them from one part of your garden to another part of your garden? Because a lot of times the bugs and the worms and stuff like that, what they do is at the end of the year they crawl down into the dirt and they get in the dirt and they leave larvae and stuff like that and then the next spring they come up and they... So if you move the squash, they're not particularly bright and they don't go all over the place looking for it. So if you have it planted, let's say, here one year, then the next year you move it 20 feet over here, you may end up not having the bugs. She says she has a small garden, but yes, she does rotate and she gets some every year. Well, you know what? Why don't you email that to me and I'll look it up? Because since I never had them, I never had to worry about getting rid of them. I did have a real problem with potato bugs for a while because I didn't realize potato bugs, tomatoes and potatoes, the same bug likes both of them. And um, what I did is, towards the end of the fall, is I put black plastic down and I kind of baked it, baked the soil as it were because the sun hit that and got it real warm. And the next year I didn't have potato bugs. But I don't know what you do for that. So if you email me, marysherbs1 at gmail.com, I will look it up for you. I'll ask my brother. Okay? Do you have any experience using uh, experience with using Dragonite? And she uh, posted a link. No, I've never had them. Okay, let's see what this is. Clicked on a link here. No, I don't want it. No thanks. Dragonite. Um, no, but that's something you can look into. Is it chemicals or is it um, natural? I try to stay away from all chemicals. Volcanic uh, salt minerals. Oh, okay, that should be good. See, I do work with my soil a lot. Not here where I used to live. I moved down with my daughter. I used to live in the Johnstown, Altoona, Pennsylvania area. And there my garden was smoking. Now it's, I don't do it like I used to. But um, I worked a lot with my soil. And the healthier your soil is, usually the less bugs you have. You know what, there's something else I did, and I bet you this would help too. And, and I'll tell you in a minute here, we're going, to, we're going to talk about different techniques of gardening. Okay, strawberries. Usually if you get like a pack of 25 strawberries, you don't need to buy strawberries ever again because they send out runners, and the next year you'll probably have a couple hundred, you know, like a hundred or so Year after that, you have a couple hundred and so on. Um, they do like some drainage. That should be butt, not by. But you have to water them every day. They can die on you. Um, they like full sun. There's two different kinds of strawberries. There are June berries. At least that's what we call them. But there's some berries that go like crazy in a June and that that's the kind of berries you want if you want to make jellies because you want to make jelly every couple of weeks and then there's ever bearing I like the ever bearing because I would just eat the strawberries you know um, I didn't make a lot of jellies and I would my strawberries would start producing strawberries in May and even if there's snow sometimes I would get Strawberries until November, all summer long. Now, it wasn't as many as this, 
there would be like maybe two strawberries on a plant. This, these ones, I would say, are probably June, June bearing strawberries. But I had them down my sidewalks. I had long sidewalks to my, my mother's house next door, and I had them on both sides of that. And then the one the sidewalk went into my house. And seriously, every day you can go out and pick a handful of strawberries. And as I said, if you have a strawberry, it'll put out a couple runners, probably three or four runners a season. And then you just cut that off and you got another plant. Okay, tomatoes. Tomatoes are... Either you usually have a great crop of tomatoes or you have a lousy crop of tomatoes. I don't seem to have either, you know, a thing in between. You do need a lot of moisture, but they do need to be in soil that is drain that drains very easy. Full sun. Years that you don't have as much sun, it's over it's cloudy and stuff like that and rainy, your tomatoes usually aren't as nice. But they need a lot of water. I I usually water my tomatoes every night. When I get them, I do two things. First, I make sure that the soil is loose about a foot deep. But uh -oh, I will plant them deep. So let's say you have a plant that is eight inches long and you have leaves stems and leaves are coming out like this. I cut all these off. I pinch them off with my fingernail. And if it's eight inches long, I will bury that tomato plant and just leave like two leaves out. You want to leave two or three leaves out because you want to make sure they get some chlorophyll. And what happens is all this part of the plant becomes a root. And if you do that, and there's a little bit of a drought, or even if it's a really hot day, you don't lose your plant because it's getting moisture from deep in. I also leave a pretty decent, I would say 18 inches at least, between them, and I cage mine. So whenever I, I buy, I have cages on hand or the first time I bought the cages. Um, when I have the plant, let's say this is plant, I put the cage in right away. And I put it in really deep so it's nice and sturdy. And then the plant will start growing up through the cage. A lot of people wait until it's too, until they're pretty far gone and they put the cage around it. And whenever they do, they um, break off some of the leaves and stems. Okay, was there a question? Yes. When you say bury the plant, do you just put soil immediately around the area, and how thick? Okay, no. I bury the plant. So I make a hole in the ground like this. I put the plant in. I fill this all up with dirt, and I just leave the two little leaves out. So I'll fill all this up with dirt. And I'll pack it pretty good. And the first time I water it, and I should have told you this, with any kind of plants, the first time you water it, you water it long and hard. Because you want to get all the dirt around the plants that there's no air pockets around the plants. Any air pockets around the plants, um, that part of the roots die. So I water it. I water it until it looks like the water's not going to soak in anymore. Then I'll water the plant next to it, and then I'll come back and I'll water it again. I'll water it like three or four times. So it's actually completely submerged in the dirt. Some people also do, 
somewhat the same technique and take off all the roots and they plant the tomato plants this way. Put the two little leaves and plant it under the dirt like this. The roots love warmth and sun. So if you do that, a lot of times um, your plants will grow more quickly. But they don't seem to be as sturdy. So that's what I like this. And you see how thick this stalk is here? That's what you want. Because if not, the weight of the tomatoes can start splitting the stems. Well, not so much just because it's hanging down. But whenever it's standing up like this, the stems can split on you. Does that, does that make sense? She says, thanks. She'll try that for sure. And there's another question. What type of tomatoes do you plant? All right. Uh, to make my tomato paste, to make my spaghetti sauce, I like Amish paste. If not, I do use Early Girl, um, Big Boy, or Rudiger's. Rudiger's, I love it. that's my favorite, but it's a little juicy. Early Girl and Big Boys are are usually they they bear fruit more quickly and a little bit more. And I like last year. No, not last year. Last year was lousy. The year before that, I had hanging tomato plants. Since I live in my daughter's home, I hate to go down through her house, her basement, to go to the backyard. Um, and I don't garden back there as much anymore. So I had them on in hanging plants, and I used cherry tomatoes for those. Those are just good for eating. But the Amish paste, I think, is the best for canning or making something out of it. And throughout the growing process of tomatoes, do you pluck off the branches that don't oops, wait, sorry, that don't have any flowers once the tomatoes start producing? No, I don't. I just, I, I don't know why, I just, no, I don't do that. I know people do that sometimes to make sure that the tomatoes are bigger. Like, I know you can do that for, like, pumpkins and um, different things that you will get a bigger plant. So, like, if you have a pumpkin vine, you can either have 10 little pumpkins or if you keep pinching all that off, and usually you eat the flowers, um, you end up with a huge, big pumpkin. But I've never done that with tomatoes. Do you do that with tomatoes? Did she answer? He answer? Uh, she said, I tried it one year and the plants didn't produce as much. Oh. Yeah, I just never did that. I don't know. I've never even heard of that for tomatoes. I have other plants, but not for tomatoes. I can tell you there's times when we have so many tomatoes we don't know what to do with them. So I know that you can have really good yield on your tomatoes and not do it. She says, I thought I'd be giving them more energy to grow bigger, but it didn't work that way. It does for some plants, but I never heard it done with tomato plants. You know, I I don't know everything, but um, I definitely would do it with a pumpkin or something like that. But, um, yeah, I don't think you have to do that. She says, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are the cages. And most of the cages, like this is the bottom part, 
has little thingies that go like this. Some people put that up on the top so they're up here, but they're there for a reason. They're so they can go deep in the ground and make this sturdy. Tomato plants get really, really heavy. If you don't stake them or put a cage around them, chances are they're going to fall and lay on the ground, and then they get the fruit will get all rotted. So it's good to either stake them or put a cage. My favorite is a cage. And like I said, as soon as I plant them, I put it on there, and they just go up right through the cage. Then that way the leaves are in here, you know, I mean the stems. This is staking them. You take um, a piece of wood and you put it on there, then you tie the tomato plants up. When I used to do this before I could afford the cages, and the cages aren't that expensive, I was just really cheap, I would use old nylons back when I actually wore nylons. Because if you use a string or something like that, it can cut through this as it gets heavier. And then it just breaks off and you're not getting anywhere with it. But if you use the nylon, that helps. I tried one year because I read it. I put newspaper down, and I didn't stake them at all because it was supposed to keep them from rotting, but it didn't. They still got rotted. The tomatoes got rotted. Okay, so those are different vegetables. The most common vegetables that people grow in their garden. If you have a certain vegetable you want to know about, like I don't like okra, so I don't know how to grow an okra. I have no idea. Um, but if you have a plant that you want to grow and we didn't cover it, if you want to ask right now, I can tell you what I know about it. Okay, none? All right. Then we're going to talk about different things that you can do, techniques. Raised bed, um, wide row and raised bed are better than single row. Do you see how there's like a group of plants here? That's called wide row. This is called single row. So look how much weeding you'd have to do here. And if this was the whole way to here to here, you get like three times the amount of plants in the same amount of um, area. But raised beds help in a couple ways. One thing, it helps with drainage. So if you have really bad clay soil, um, you can just build one of these and put good soil in it, and you don't have to worry about playing around with the soil that much. It also helps a lot with bending over. Now, this guy's on his knee. The one that we have in our backyard, and I only did raised beds since I've come here, is probably about a foot and a half high. So I get a bucket, I sit my butt on a bucket, and I can do it, and I don't have, it saves my knees, because I'm old. And um, my knees only have so many more bends in them, I think. It's just much more comfortable. This is a way of um, making it look a little more interesting. Now this is what I would do, in a perfect world, I would do with my um, cucumber plants. Because they would grow up the pole and then the fruit just hang here. I showed you that one back further, but it wasn't as big as this one. But if you had this and they would grow, and they will grow up, they'll find it and they'll grow up, then the fruit would just hang here and you could just pluck it off and you can let the vine alone. Uh, okay, pest. I used to live where there, I was surrounded by woods on three sides. 
and I mean a couple many yards to many miles of woods. It all depends what size you're talking about. And I don't have near the amount of pest problem as we have down here. We live basically off of a main road. And um, there's houses quite close together, much closer than it was where I used to live. You could throw a ball from my, win my house and break the next guy's window easily. But the pests here are crazy. And I think it's for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's because nobody around here grows a garden. So this is like the Keller smorgasbord. Keller is my daughter and son-in-law's name. And all the critters from all over the place have like a, a smorgasbord in our backyard at night. And that's been our biggest problem here. You can put up really heavy-duty um, wire. What I would do is I would get wire at least for about here down, and I'd put really skinny little wires. And I'll show you in a minute what that looks like because that's what we did for the bottom. Because this, little bunnies can go in there. So you want to make sure that it is really small, including this, this uh, chicken wire. Rabbits can get in there. Weeds, as I said, I hate to weed. The wide row helps. You can take grass clippings. You know, a lot of times whenever you mow the grass, you can get this bag that you put on it, and you can put the grass clippings all around your plants, and that will keep the weeds from growing up. You can put leaves the same way. This is why the very, and this is what I was thinking, the lady who had the worms that attacked their squash, this would probably be ideal for you. I had, a friend of mine had five-year-old hay in those big circles that go like this. Do you ever see them in the yard? They look like big, they usually cover them like with white plastic or something like that. Well, he gave me five of those. And um, he delivered my house and I rolled them on my garden, my 50 by 75 foot garden all five rows, I mean, all five big thingies of them. And it was about a foot deep of this hay. I just had to make open a hole, and I put my plant down in the dirt. And I just left the hay kind of around it. It did a lot of things. It kept all the weeds out. I did not have to weed my garden at all that year. It was full of spiders. The spiders kept down all the bugs. I had no bug problem at all. And that's what I did for my potato bug problem. Oops. You can put weed barrier, black plastic. Some people put cardboard or newspapers. But this was amazing because I put it on at the end of the growing season, the one year. So that year it snowed and it rained and all the nutrients from that old um, hay, plus the bacteria and the molds that grew in it, went down into the soil, made it really, really rich. And like I said, spiders galore. There's just spiders everywhere. And it took, seemed to take care of all the bugs. The times whenever I did have bugs before that, I would take capsicum, which is cayenne pepper that's really, really hot, and garlic, and I would put it in water, smash up the garlic with the capsicum, soak it in water, then I'd drain it off, and i use that as a spray. And that'll keep critters away, it'll keep like rabbits away, 
it will keep bugs away. The only downfall is every time it rains or every time you water, you'll lose some of that, so you have to spray it pretty often. I had one of those pump sprays. You went pumped it a couple times, and then you just held a button and it sprayed. But to have something you have to, like, pump, you know, like um, Windex or something like that, that would, I don't think that would be feasible. Another thing someone told me, and I did not do it for the whole garden, although I did do it on a couple plants in the house, is NSP concentrate. They said if you take NSP concentrate and you spray your garden, that it does the same thing. Someone's asking if isn't that a cleaner, a household cleaner? It is. Yep, but it's a non-toxic household cleaner. So it's a household household cleaner that people sometimes brush their teeth with it. I don't because ew, it tastes terrible. But it's non-toxic. Okay, now this is a little bit like what my thing looked like, although mine was deeper. I mean, we're talking a good foot to 18 inches. I mean, it's really a lot deeper than this. But see, anywhere where all this um, hay is, it's not going to grow up weeds. The only thing is you have to make, and this is vitally important, you have to make sure that the hay is at least three years old. If not, all the seeds to the weeds are going to be in that hay are still going to be viable, and you will have weeds all through your garden. So make sure that it is at least three years old, at least. Here's somebody else who used um, a pellet. A lot of times you get these pellets for free. I know you used to, I used to be able to go to Altoona, the Altoona Mirror, which is a place that um, produced a newspaper. And if one of these pellets had a crack or something like that, they would just give them to you for free. Free is my favorite place, my favorite price. But you fill this in, and then you don't have weeds in between. Another thing, these are shoe racks. I think most of these things are, um, I'm not really sure what that is. It almost looks like a, that can't be potato. But anyhow, most of these I think are herbs. You can put dirt in and hang it. It'll keep the critters away. Here's somebody else that did it um, on rain spouting. I've never done these. These are just inventive ideas I have seen. Because remember I said, you know, things like lettuce and spinach and stuff like that, they don't need deep soil. Okay, hanging, this is what I did last year, hanging cherry plants. But the ones I had were longer. They were like down to here. Not last year, the year before. Last year my daughter got the wrong kind of plants for me. She got... Um, bush tomato plants, and they did lousy, but the cherry tomatoes did really good. You can hang cherry plants, I mean, it's not cherry plants, tomato plants upside down. And I did that one year, and it was starting to do pretty good. There's two problems. One, they didn't get much sun, because that part, the garden in the back doesn't get hardly any sun anyhow, just part of the day. And tomatoes love, love, love sun. And then the other thing is it was real wide, and I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. In a minute. And my dog kept on running underneath and breaking them all apart. I have a 110-pound mini golden doodle. And um, he'd run through there and knock, just busted up the plants like crazy. But this, you had the plant growing here. The roots are getting the sun. 
and then you can put stuff for sell it on top. Very efficient way of growing a plant. Here's someone that made a trellis for their things to grow up the side of the wall. Well, this is going to keep the critters from eating it as much, and it makes it easier to uh, harvest. I can give you this. This is things that you can grow with other things. Companion planting. Remember I told you about the the peppermint and the, and the cabbage? Well, there's different things like um, I don't have any of these. Marigolds. Bunnies usually don't like marigolds. So if you put marigolds around um, your garden, it a lot of times keeps the bunnies out. Unless you live in Landisville. This worked at home in Patton, Pennsylvania. In Landisville, nothing. They would just eat the marigolds down. They have mutated animals down here or something. I don't know. This is something my brother did. Uh, he lives out in the boonies, and... Um, he has a lot of gardens. He had the garden on top of the hill, I told you, but he also has other gardens. He has like one, two, three, four, five gardens in his land, on his three acres of ground. And he built this chicken pen. The chickens can go inside and sleep and roost at night. And then he puts this with a little hitch at the back of his um, thing you mow the grass with lawnmower, but like the little um, tractor-type lawnmower, and he can move it. So he'll have them like this, and then in a couple days he moves, uh, not a couple days, a couple hours he moves it, and they eat all the bugs, They and he does it in the spring. He doesn't do it like during the tomato time, but they'll eat all the grass and the early weeds down to nothing. It'll be like plain. And then he moves it, and he does that. And then they poop, which fertilizes the ground. A friend of mine's um, son was a country boy, and he and his wife got married and moved to the city. And he had, this wasn't his, but this is like an idea of what he did. But he had um, like a little Fourier, not Fourier, Ranza. What would you call it? Terrace. He had like a terrace off of his apartment, and he he uh, planted in containers. He had enough that he could actually do some canning of tomatoes. This is something else some people do. I don't know what these were from, but you can move them around. This is the best kind of strawberry planter. Uh, there's not strawberries in here. These are all herbs. But they have strawberry planters that are just holes here. Those aren't as good because the um, after a while, whenever you water them, the dirt comes out and the plant starts falling out. But if you have these little cup thingies here, when you water it, the, the earth doesn't come out. The dirt doesn't come out of it. So these are the best kind to get, not the other ones. This is one of the ones I have. This one's really nice. When you water up here, it drains down into here. But there's good drainage. And then mine has a, a chain that you can hang it up if you wanted to. I don't hang it up, but... So what you do is you plant the bottom one, then you put the one on top, and you plant that one, and you put the other one on top. And you just spin it around once in a while to make sure, you know, turn it so that they all get the sun. Here's someone who kind of made his own out of stuff. This would be cool. Um, okay. Aquaponics is basically they put fish down here, 
they put the water up here, which fertilizes and waters the plant. Then the water goes down here, which fertilize, you know, fertilizes a little bit too. And by the time it goes down here, the water is clean. So you don't really have to clean the water all the time. So the fish fertilizes the the poop, fertilizes the plants, and the plants cleanses the water. I don't know what this one's trying to see. No, I can't do that. Here's another thing that you grow plants, cucumber, squash, gourds, and then you just go through and you pick it. Brilliant idea. You know, so we could here's again. This they don't even have it grown in the ground, they have them in pots. This is really cool. If somebody is really rich to have a salad bar salad table and when you're eating you just pick off whatever you want in your salad this is a poor man's water I don't really stick something up that just waters it because you're watering the soil that can grow weeds with the plants I usually purposely water where the plants are but this is just a a soda bottle and you put on that and then you move it every once in a while this would be nice to have this in the house you would have to have UV lighting though to make sure the plants will grow but look all these cre you know creative ideas you can make a whole wall like this You can plant it in everything, anything. This is how this person did their strawberry plants. We bought, I don't know if I have them here, I bet I don't. We have planters that we bought like that that has um, this hole right down the middle and then this around, you put the plants in there, and then when you water it, there's holes through here, the whole way down. So you just water this tube here and all the plants get watered. You don't have to worry about the plants falling out of the holes. Somebody made a shed and they had their garden on top of their shed. That would keep rabbits and stuff like that away. Okay, you can do this like this or the way that we did. One year what we did is we got a black garbage can. And we put the potato, we put a little bit of dirt in it. Not much, maybe three inches. And then we put the potato plants in. And we filled it up to six more inches. So it'd be a total of nine inches from here to here. Then as the plants started growing, we added more dirt. And we kept adding dirt until it hit the top of the um, thingy. And you have to water it really well because you want to get the water the whole way down. But the potatoes will form along the roots. So the deeper the roots, or the more roots there are, the more potatoes they are the potatoes develop like this. And then we took a tarp and we dumped out whenever the plants start dying. We knew it was time to harvest and we dumped out the over the garbage can and we rooted through it and we got all the potatoes out of it. Or you can do it this way and just keep adding the boards when you add the dirt. The black garbage can was really easy because you just had to tip it over. You didn't have to take it apart. This would be cool. That's how they grow their, their strawberries. 
if you have a hill and you don't really have any place to garden, you can trellis it off like this. Put steps, and these are places where you can sit to work the garden. This person has a slide you can slide down. I don't know if I'd do that. The kids would play on it. They have these kind of things that you can grow in your kitchen now. They're really, really expensive, like a thousand or some dollars or more. But um, same with this. So these are just ideas of different ways that you can grow things. Isn't that cool? And they're pretty. Easy to take care of. So if you don't have a garden or a big lot, say you just have a walk path, you could still have a little bit of a garden. There's some places where you're not allowed to have a garden in your front yard, which is a shame because a well-kept garden is pretty. I think. There's people that didn't even bother getting it. They just cut open the potting soil bag and grew right from there. Okay. Again, these could be herbs. Another thing is I had um, chives. Chives are a really pretty plant. They look like um, a certain kind of grass, and they get these real pretty purple, puffy flowers around them. And then if you want to have baked potatoes and chives, you just go out and cut it off, and it grows up again. This is people that took bales of hay, and they planted right in the bale of hay. There's a guy down the street here that has one of these. What he does at night is he pulls it across. I think it does two things. I think it keeps the animals out from eating it, and anytime there's frost or anything like that, they would be protected. It would be easy. You just pull over like this, and he must lock it or something. It looks like it's pretty straight because even if it's windy, it stays closed. See, that's even, I think it's kind of cute. That'd be interesting to have in your yard. These are just so imaginative. I mean, this is to keep out the bugs and the animals, the chickens going up around there. This is a guy who took his swimming pool, and later on, um, you can see he and his wife and two kids live off of just what they produce in what used to be their swimming pool. This is about how high mine is, so I don't have to bend over. Oh, here's our tomato thingies. And they were really cheap, I think like $25. I mean, strawberry thingies. That's my granddaughter, how cute she is. This is what I made for the tomato plants that my dog kept on breaking off. We put lattice. Well, first we put weed barrier. Then we put lattice. Then I made holes in here and planted my tomato plant. And they hung. This is upside down. This is the legs. And it would have worked if the dog didn't kept on going through there and 
breaking off the plants. There's our planters planted. Before we watered it, as you can tell. I think we had five of these. Then this is my plant for my herbs. Another pot we had for herbs. Since the backyard keeps getting eaten. Okay, so this is this is higher than we it looks. This right here, from here to here, is four foot. So this is what about two foot? Cause see all these trees back here. It doesn't get much sunlight. You can see the sun over here, but oh, here's my tomato plants. I even haven't planted. See my tomato plants hanging down. I don't think the lettuce is coming up yet. And then this part here, we have terrible time with groundhogs. A groundhog will climb over this fence. My daughter saw it climb over this fence one time. And it will eat anything. Usually tomato plants, you don't have to worry about animals eating tomato plants because they're not so nice tasting. When I lived where we had raccoons and deers and everything, we didn't have tomato plants being eaten. But here, the stupid groundhog was eating our tomato plants. And hang on a sec. Say something brilliant, okay, Joanne? She wants me to say something brilliant, but I know absolutely nothing about gardening. <laughs> Do many of you have gardens? Where I live, we don't really have an opportunity to. Okay, I'm back. So, um, so this is a real, I don't know if I have a picture of the mesh. Yeah, this is the mesh. Do you see how small those holes are? They are really only about, not even, yeah, about a half an inch. Because we kept on having groundhogs that would dig under and eat the plants. Cherie wants to know what's a groundhog. <laughs> what's a groundhog? You don't know what Groundhog's Day is? Um, groundhog is an animal. It looks kind of like a beaver without the flat tail. And it digs holes in the ground and lives in the ground and it will destroy a garden. So look, type in um, Groundhog's Day, and you'll see what a groundhog looks like. They're kind of cute, but they can be very destructive to a garden. And that's why we use this little wire. Oops. This little wire here, because, you know, we were going to put wire around it, but we knew that he would climb up underneath. Not a very good picture, but this is a picture of my chives. Sage. I put sage in the front to keep down bugs. Sage, lemongrass, um, helps keep down ticks and bugs. There's a question. Um, Amy wants to know, with composting, worms are a good sign of how healthy your composite your compost soil is yes but when you use that compost soil in your garden the worms are bad worms are always good worms do two things they eat stuff and they excrete fertilizer they also aerate the soil so um, it doesn't get real tight around the plants so worms are always good However, in a closed system like a tumbler or in that black thing that I showed you that I got from the extension office, um, they typically don't grow worms because they keep the heat so high that the worms 
can't live. When I take our compost out, the dirt usually isn't full of compost. But once you put it in the soil, then all the worms from the neighborhood will go, whoo, and it come over, you know. And they'll grow very quickly. She says, I think I got confused when you were talking about cabbage and cabbage worms. Okay, cabbage worms are not garden worms. They're not earthworms. Thank you so much for saying that. I didn't even think of that. Um, earthworms are worms that live in the dirt, and they eat dirt. Cabbage worms are worms that are white, whitish, and they actually eat inside of the of the cabbage, and they eat the cabbage from the inside out. They're two different things. The cabbage worms remind me more of... Um, can't think of the name of the word. Grubs, like a grub worm. So let's see here. Let me do this. Okay. Earth worm. These are earth worms right here. These are good. You want as many of these as you can in your garden. I don't think you can have too many earthworms. Okay? This is a cabbage worm. Like a worm that would hit a tomato. So they're like this. Well, I guess they get greenish too, but they're kind of like a whitish. These are cabbage worms. And they eat the cabbage and destroy the cabbage. So there are two different kinds of worms. She says, ah, yes, I understand now. Thank you. Thank you, because I didn't think of um, differentiating the two. I knew what I was talking about, but, you know, so, yeah, there are two different kinds of worms. Oh, you see how small this is? This is the bottom of our one raised bed. Look how small that is. That's the kind that you would want. These are not mine. These are somebody else's. But there's like a little seed here. There was one that uh, a bench that whenever I used to work at a lawn and garden center, there was a bench that they had that you could grow different kinds of um, herbs. And you sat down on a bench, and sitting down on a bench would bruise the herbs, and it would give you the smell. That's pretty cool. Here's somebody who uses cedar blocks. Again, I would make a, I would use a different kind of wire here. Because if you have little bunnies, they could get in there. Okay, these are things that mosquitoes do not like. Lemon balm, catnip, marigolds, garlic, rosemary, basil, lemon, thyme, lavender. You put those around where you sit at night, and the mosquitoes will stay away from you. Also citronella. But... Okie dokie. So, does anybody have any questions? Uh, Amy says, I love creeping time for ground cover. Get rid of grass. It smells like lemon when you step on it. Yeah. Um, we had some chamomile out there, and you could smell the chamomile whenever they would mow the grass. It felt so good. Um, yeah, rosemary smells good. Any of those things. Like I said, some of them keep the mosquitoes away. So if you have a front porch or something like that that you would like to um, 
spend the evening on. You could do that. This is what Joanne did. Wow, can you imagine that? This is by me, actually. This is the Hard Rock Hotel. It's 8,000 square feet of living wall that they use. Um, this is inside, and it's there to help uh, filter the air, and it's just it goes all the way around. It's just I couldn't find a better picture of it. Wow, that's cool. Someday I would love to have something like that in my house. I do bring that thing, that one strawberry planter that's on three tiers in, and I can use the fresh herbs to cook. You can bring it inside. Very cool. Okay. So there's a lot of reasons to have a garden. There are so many... I don't even have, I didn't even have the seed savers on here, did I? No, okay. Um, but I use whenever possible non -gen non genetic modified plants. I use um, seed saver. Quite a few of burpee are. I'm not convinced all of burpee are. But genetically modified vegetables are not as healthy for you. Matter of fact, there are some things that actually indicate that genetically modified plants can cause cancers, allergies, different things in the body. There's also something very nice about just going in your backyard and picking your supper. It's just, it, you won't know it until you've done it. It's just really cool. And, like, you know, the coronavirus, things are going to be hitting us financially. I don't think, I think coronavirus is all blown out of proportion. But I do believe that things are going to be tough financially and food-wise for a while, mostly because of the panic. Um, but if you have your own garden and something like that happens, you're covered. If you can bring some of that and learn how to do it in the house, you're covered. You know? Okay, does anybody have any questions? If you do have a garden, please send me your pictures. I love what, looking at pictures of people's gardens. And they don't have to be weed-free, because let me tell you, mine, they're never weed-free. Okay. Any questions or comments? LaRue says, very interesting. Thank you. What's our next class? Respiratory allergies. All right. Well, Joanne, thank you, thank you. You know, I know you probably get tired of me saying it, but I thank you so much for doing this. Um, My pleasure. Well, it really makes it so much easier for me, and I appreciate you doing all that. Oh, you you're go welcome. way beyond. Oh, thank you. Amy says, um, great webinar. I'll send you some photos of our gardens through the years. Julie says, thank you, ladies. LaRue says, I have raised garden I have a raised garden at our summer camp and Bonnie says thank you. Well good. Well thank you guys for coming and hopefully we'll see you again sometime. All right. Well you all take care and um Joanne thank you. And if you need me you can contact me. I guess Joanne doesn't do a lot of gardening so this time maybe just contact me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a black thumb. But it was very interesting. <laughs> did you ever get comfrey plant? It died. How did you do? Oh, you must have a black thumb. I keep trying to tell you I've killed a cactus. It's I'm not. It's I'm not exaggerating. <laughs>
If you kill Comfrey, then you got a special talent. Mm. <laughs> so if anybody wants a Comfrey plant, which is an herb we're going to cover when we do the Herbology 1, 2, and I think it's Herbology 3 that we, it, we talk about doing Comfrey poultices, um, email me at the end of May, and I'll send you a free start for the Comfrey plant. I'll even send you another joint. You have to try again. Okay. <laughs> Maybe this time. I should do what they did and just, like, open the bag of dirt and stick it in there and see what happens. No. No, but you said it, it needs it needs deep roots. I don't know. It does. It needs deep, deep roots. I'm willing to try again. <laughs> okay. All right. We well, all take care. Good night, everybody. Night.